This is a very large room, and uh, for those watching uh, the video, I want you to know it is completely full, and everyone here will back <laughs> me up on that, as you can hear. You may be wondering uh, why there's a picture of Hawaii on this title slide. It's because uh, I like to show people my vacation pictures, you know, the, the way people used to force their neighbors and friends to watch slideshows at their house. So thanks for participating with that. So my name is Justin Collins. Uh, on the internet, you can find me under President Beef. I generally look like this uh, or that on the internet. The fun thing about Gravatar, once you pick a picture, it's you for life. I work at a company called Synopsys. Among other things, we have products to help you write better, safer code, static analysis tools, dependency analysis tools. Uh, we also have security consulting. Uh, amongst other things, and happy to talk about that afterwards if you'd like. I just want to get this out of the way right up front, that this is an awkward talk for me. It's weird for me because it's not a technical talk, and it's weird for me because I'm talking about myself, which I like talking about myself, but usually not on stage. So I just want to get that out of the way. Also, uh, I used a lot of drop shadow in this talk, just preparing you for that and apologizing a little bit. So here's some drop shadows. Uh, so uh, this is kind of split up into three different parts. Gonna talk a little bit about uh, my experience, some challenges that I experienced during that experience, and then let's talk about some open source ideas in general. Start off with my experience. This is what I look like in 2010. I'm the one on the right. In 2010, I did not know it, but I was at the midpoint of my PhD career, and my advisor was kind of running out of money, and so I had to find a job. So I, I found a summer internship at a company called AT&T Interactive. You may recall this company. They used to sponsor a lot of Ruby events. That's why I applied there. Also, the place where Aaron Patterson and Ryan Davis used to work, I did not talk to them at all because I was way too shy to do so. Um, and when I got the internship at AT&T Interactive, it was on the security team, which basically kicked off my career in security. And while I was there, I created a tool called Breakman that you heard about a moment ago, static analysis security tool for Ruby on Rails. I hope at this point most people are aware and are using it, but if not, that's okay. This is how you use it. You install it, and then you run it, and you'll get a report about potential vulnerabilities in your application. So uh, I created this, again, as an internship project, and then I said, hey, I, I want to open source this. You know, like, let's open source this. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. And I said, cool, what, what license do you want me to use? And they said, oh, we usually use MIT. I remember this conversation very clearly. It was very casual, like, yeah, I use MIT. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll release it, put it under MIT. I found my original tweet about it. You can tell it's old because the link is not linkified, and also it uses a link shortener. Uh, this was actually a few weeks after Breakman was released. Anyways, the link goes to my blog on this wonderful website that I used to have with a bunch of drop shadows, as you can see. And there's a, a line in there where it says, unfortunately, it's not yet compatible with Rails 3.0. That is because Rails 3.0 was released a week after the first version of Breakman was released. So let's jump forward now. Uh, I did kind of have an inkling that this was near the end of my PhD. I ran into a gentleman named Jim Manico in the middle at a conference, and he said, hey, Justin, uh, if you ever think about turning Breakman into a commercial product, building a company around it, let me know. I'd like to help. I'd like to be involved. 
maybe in a small way, maybe in a big way, I'd like to be involved. Now, Jim Manico is a well-known figure in the web application space. He started a few companies, he's written uh, at least one book that I'm aware of, and he's very involved in, in the community. So to have someone like this reaching out to me and saying, hey, like, I'd be interested in helping you start a business, I was like, well, actually, that's uh, pretty crazy. I, I wouldn't have expected that, but I followed up with him later, and I was like, were you serious about that? <laughs> do you really want to help me do this? And he said, yeah, let's do it. He's like, but you know, you should really bring in Neil, Neil Matatol, who's the gentleman on the right. Um, I think you should really bring him in. Now, Neil is and was the number two committer to Breakman, and also my coworker. <laughs> so I was like, yes, uh, let's bring Neil in. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you might notice that this picture is in Hawaii, and it looks kind of recent. That's because we took this picture a couple weeks ago uh, at a conference in Hawaii, and I said, look, we have to get a picture of the three of us together because we have no pictures of the three of us, the founders of company, together. So that's why it looks recent and it was in Hawaii. So we ended up starting Breakman Pro, kind of in the vein of Sidekick Pro or any of these other companies where you just kind of throw Pro at the end. Not a lot of thought put into the name, honestly. Uh, about a year and a half later, we put out the first version of Breakman Pro. What was Breakman Pro? Uh, I actually get this question a lot, and that means I really failed as a business person. <laughs> so first of all, we built a desktop application, kind of a front end for Breakman. This was built on JRuby and JRubyFX, and we bundled it up with Java and everything. And people really liked the interface that was put together by our UX guy, Adam Corman. Uh, so that was one piece, and that was like completely separate from Breakman, the open source project, just completely separate code base, completely separate thing. Then we also had like the pro version of the gem, which we called the engine, and it was basically like the open source one. You could even type Breakman, and it would run Breakman Pro. So kind of the same thing. Then we had this third piece, which was the Code Climate Pro engine, um, which allowed you to run Breakman Pro on Code Climate. Now you might have noticed we did not build a SaaS. We did not build a SaaS product or a service around Breakman itself. So a little bit different than a lot of open source to commercial kind of conversions. There are a lot of reasons for this. One of those reasons is, well, Code Climate already existed as well as several other, what I call Breakman as a service providers. And it didn't really make sense to me to like redo the work that they'd already done. And I wanted to focus on actually making Breakman better, not like trying to build a whole SaaS around it. So we started the company and then we basically had something like this sort of very slow but steady customer growth. There's like a little bit of a jump in the middle. I believe that was because of RailsConf uh, 2017. Seemed to get a bit of a bump from that. And just kind of like continue up, you know, up and to the right. Of course, that happens when you count total customers. Anyways, um, so last year, 2018, Breakman and Breakman Pro were acquired by a company called Synopsys which I mentioned before is where I now work. So that is like a very compressed uh, eight years of Breakman, Breakman Pro, and you know, sort of sets up, now you know the history of where I'm coming from with this. So now let's talk about some challenges, and I, I tried to focus on the challenges that arise from taking something that's open source and trying to build a company around it. It's also kind of, like my challenges. I don't want to represent uh, the other people in the company. This was like things that I struggled with. Uh, first thing first uh, is naming things. I think we're aware naming things is hard. And I think I did a spectacular job. Uh, there was a thing called Breakman, right? That was the open source project. The company uh, we called Breakman Inc. And then we, there was sort of a 
umbrella thing, Breakman Pro, and then there's Breakman Pro Desktop, Breakman Pro Engine, and then something I could never figure out what to call, Breakman Pro Code Climate Engine, because Code Climate also calls their things engines. So we had a thing called Engine, they had a thing called Engine, and then we ended up with two things called Engine. It, it's just, you know, uh, someone else probably could have done a better job on naming these things. And uh, I got called out on it. I had posted a blog about um, something similar to this talk, actually, some difficulties around commercializing open source. And this lady came along and she's like, yeah, so in other words, this is why you should never try to use the same brand name for your revenue product and your open source project. And I'm like, well, okay, but you know, you, all, you kind of want to capitalize on the name recognition, right? And she followed up with uh, fundamentally irreconcilable. Name is equal to value proposition, so you can't have two different value propositions with the same name. And just to drive this home, I, and this is real because I pulled up these tweets a couple days ago, this tweet is her pinned tweet on her profile. So every now and then someone will come by and like it, reminding me that I got called out on this, even though we've sold the company. <laughs> okay. This is, these aren't actually in any particular order, but I would say this is one of the hardest things. When you have something that's open source and then you want people to start paying for something related to it, now you're competing not only with something that's free, but your own free thing that you are still maintaining and updating and so on. This is something I heard a few times. Hey, the free version of Breakman is great. We don't really need pro. And for me, that was like, wow, thanks for the compliment, but also, can you still buy my thing? <laughs> oh no, the free version, it, it's so good. We, we really don't see the need to buy the pro version. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to argue. There's another thing that happened, which is we, and mostly me, uh, completely flubbed the initial pricing. So initially, and I, I tried to pull this up from some, uh, some old documents that I had. Initially, we were gonna charge $2,500 a year for an individual to use the pro version of the Breakman gem. And if you wanted that desktop app, that was another $2,500 a year. And I know what happened. What happened was we were thinking this is a security tool. If you price it as a security tool, this almost makes sense. But our initial audience was folks like you, folks at RailsConf, developers for the most part, asking someone to go from, hey, I'm not paying anything for this tool, to please pay $2,500 a year, like did not get us anywhere. And I totally understand it. And this is a problem for any situation where you're competing with something that's free. You have to justify going from $0 to some number of dollars. And that's a tricky thing to do. We did revise the pricing. I can't remember if this is the second or third set of prices that we had, but we ended up anchoring at this, uh, the lowest price being $500 a year individual with the desktop app. Um, and also $1,000 a year sort of like site license for the gym, which we can talk afterwards, but not a super awesome business decision to be like, yeah, $1,000 a year and you can use this thing as much as you want. Doesn't matter how big your company is, it doesn't matter. We also had a pricing later on where we added monthly pricing and we bump, actually ended up bumping these prices up a little bit on the higher end as well. Um, but still you had to just make this justification of, well, there's a free thing, why should I pay anything? All right, number two challenge. I gotta go faster. All right, uh, marketing to the community. I think this might have been more of a personal challenge for me, but I had this weird feeling of like, I don't wanna be like, I don't know, like skeezy about pushing people to pay for something when they're happy using the open source version, right? So I wrote this email back when Breakman had a mailing list, kind of saying like, hey, we're gonna do this Breakman Pro thing, but like, you know, don't worry about it. And one thing I said in particular was, this will be the only email I send to this list regarding Breakman Pro. And at the time, I felt very strongly about this. I'm like, look, I. 
I don't want to be there pushing a paid product on the community, right? But this was also really dumb because this is, these are the customers. These are the people who are looking for a solution like this. I don't know, it might have been a personal problem, but uh, this was a challenge that I had. And then of course it created further challenges because I had already made this promise. So uh, I stuck to it. Of course the mailing list died, but that's a different thing. Okay, let's get into something a little bit more meaty. meaty. So managing open source and proprietary development. You might think it looks like this. You have the open source version and then you fork it and then that's it, right? You have your open source, you have your paid fork. Uh, my experience has been a little bit more like this. Stuff goes from open source into the paid and then sometimes I, uh, you know, you're working on something and then you realize, oh, actually this needs to go into the open source version. Uh, little tip, if you have a closed proprietary branch, do not merge things from that branch into your free branch and bring all of your Git history along with you. That's a bad idea. The good side of this, uh, from my perspective, is it led me to mostly focus on trying to put things into the open source version as much as possible and keeping a little bit cleaner separation with the paid features. You may wonder then, okay, what goes into the paid version? What goes into the open source version? And a lot of people, when a, a project does a commercial fork, they get a little bit worried about this. Oh, you're gonna abandon the open source, right? And that was something I didn't want people to feel, of course. Uh, so I, I kind of came up with a system, and this is a bit specific to me, but maybe it will help you think of something if you're thinking about going down this road. And I kind of came up with, there's three properties of the open source version of Breakman that I, I think are important. One, that it's fast. Two, that it has, let's say, relatively low false positives. An attempt is made to keep that low. And number three, it is developer focused. It's made to be easy for developers to use. And then I thought, okay, so then the proprietary version can be slower, that's fine. It can produce a wider array of results, maybe more false positives, but we have tools to help you deal with those, like with the desktop app. And then maybe it'll be more security person focused than developer focused. And that helped me make some decisions about which features go where. Uh, for example, uh, no one's really too worried about PDF reports and Excel reports being in the open source version. People, n no one really asked for that. But that's something that if you're a security professional, you might wanna have. Unfortunately, there's another level to this. Breakman is not just some open source project, right? It's not just a, a database or a web server or something along those lines. It's actually a security tool. So now you have to wonder, okay, if I do not put this feature into the open source version, am I somehow affecting the security of Rails applications that people are using for their businesses, for their livelihood, to keep data safe? This is something I really wrestled with, to say like, okay, well, if I don't put this in the open source, am I somehow causing people to be less secure because they're not getting the paid feature? And so like I said, I tried to focus more on things not so much related to does it find more security issues or not. Uh, of course, compromises were made, but I tried to err on the side of if it's finding valuable security features, let's try to put it in the open source. A uh, real quick comment on this. I don't know why, but every time someone does a commercial fork, someone has to come along and be like, oh, but what if someone opens a pull request that implements your proprietary features? As if this is like some gotcha that no one's ever thought of before, right? In my experience, I, I, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this happen. I've never seen this happen where someone spends the time to implement a proprietary feature and then like try to submit it back as open source like, it, it's not, it doesn't seem like something that happens, and it definitely is not something you have to like plan for up front, right? You can deal with it one-off basis. This was also kind of a personal problem. Um, these were all the things I had to do to do a Breakman Pro and Breakman open source release, which I almost always did at the same time. And by one day of work, I mean like starting at like nine or 10 in the morning and finishing like midnight or one in the morning. 
So uh, this is just, again, maybe this doesn't apply to every <laughs> commercialized open source project, but this was a problem that I had. Another problem that just is a business problem, sales are hard. Uh, I heard this a few times, not, not blaming anyone, but people would say, hey, that sounds awesome, Breakman Pro, I wanna buy that. Let me know when it comes out, I will buy that. A lot of those people never bought it. And I'm not blaming them because uh, developers don't really buy software. If you want to buy software at a company or spend money on something, probably you're not authorized to do that. You have to ask your manager, they have to go to a budget, you gotta go through a procurement process, you have to justify it as a business expense. So someone at like a RailsConf telling me this and me getting excited about it, um, kind of masks the reality of how things are purchased in a company, right? Another thing that happens, well, companies do not buy software to be nice. They're not gonna say, oh, you, I can pay you for something I'm using for free? I will do that because I'm a nice person. I'm a nice company, I wanna support you. Now, I can't look into the hearts of all of our customers, but from you know, feedback and so on, I would say less than five companies purchase Breakman Pro out of the goodness of their hearts because they wanted to support the open source version. Of course, the ones that did, thank you. Okay. Um, so legal and moral questions. As you can tell, I tend to wrestle with these moral questions anyway, but let's talk about some more. Who owns the code? Who owns the code in an open source project? My understanding of US copyright law, it's whoever wrote the code and possibly their employers, depending on their employment contract. So if I'm going to sell their code, is that okay? Is it okay that I'm taking someone else's work and I'm turning it into something that I'm charging money for? I don't know, this, this is a question you have to answer if you're gonna take something that's open source and try to make a business out of it. Unless you have zero contributors, which uh, is kind of rare, I'd say. Another thing that came up, this is not a moral thing exactly, but um, I had never worried about GPL dependencies and now I had to worry about them because we packaged it up and we distributed the software. Uh, in Breakman's case, there were like one or two and they weren't critical, so we ended up removing them. If you wanna take a picture of the challenges, here's the challenges, here's a summary. Let's move on because I'm behind on time. Let's talk about open source. Let's talk about um, why we feel the way we feel about open source. And I think it's a lot like the keynote yesterday. What are the stories that we've been told about open source? How has that formed the narrative that we all feel about open source? Well, probably goes back to these two gentlemen, back to Richard Stallman, uh, and Eric S. Raymond, Stallman being the founder of the Free Software Foundation, Eric S. Raymond being involved in the open source initiative, essentially the two foundations which define open source for us today. We're gonna come back to them. So there's some articles that have been coming out recently. This one was back in February. It says, the internet was built on the free labor of open source developers. Is that sustainable? And I feel like the way they phrase that, you have to say like, no, probably not. I don't know, built on the internet seems like a big thing, free labor, uh, probably not sustainable. Um, now DHH had a, a thought on this, so if you, if you want to pause and go and watch his and then come back, we'll wait. All right, we're, we're gonna move on. Okay, so uh, according to a report put out by Synopsys, where I work, uh, a few days ago, 60% um, of commercial code is open source components. This is based on our dependency analysis tool and our customers. And in the report, they say this actually might be a low estimate. Some estimates are as high as 90%. So 60 to 90% of the code that companies are using to run their businesses, to make money, to generate revenue is coming from open source. And likelihood that they're paying for that or even contributing back, low, let's say. More specifically, this article came out 
last week, and this is just like a, a trend that I noticed of articles coming out that made me like have to keep changing my talk a little bit. So they say Amazon is, has gone from neutral platform to cutthroat competitor, say open source developers. Uh, but I like the title they have in the URL, which you can't read and I almost can't. It says open source betrayed industry leaders accuse Amazon of playing a rigged game with AWS, which I feel is like more of like a 1920s kind of newspaper headline. And I encourage you to go read this article because I don't have time to go in depth with it. It's a long article and it has a lot of details. But let me just uh, give you some, uh, some other articles that, are, that led to this one. So AWS, Amazon, I know they're a sponsor of this conference. I'm not trying to call them out, but they're in the news in the last couple weeks. Well, last couple months. They published this article, Keeping Open Source Open, Open Distro for Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch had started kind of mixing up its open source and proprietary code. Amazon wasn't happy about that, so they forked it to have a pure open source uh, distribution for Elasticsearch. MongoDB changed their license. Amazon takes aim at MongoDB with launch of MongoDB compatible document DB. So they're like, all right, forget MongoDB. We will re-implement it ourselves and provide an API just like MongoDB. And the article points at the license change for this. Uh, MongoDB op open source, server-side public license rejected. So not a good response from the community. Uh, Redis Labs, why Redis Labs made a huge mistake when it changed its open source licensing strategy. Redis Labs changes its open source license again. One thing that comes up a lot when these things happen is people say, look, you change the license, that's not open source. And we know it's not open source because open source is defined by the Open Source Institute. And one of the things that's part of the definition of open source is you can't have any restrictions on the use of it, who uses it, what they use it for. If you do that, it's not open source. Okay. So. We have this idea uh, of open source. We have this idea of if you change the license, it's not open source anymore. And if you do that, well, we're just gonna, first of all, we're gonna be angry as a community and we're gonna fork things and we're, we're just gonna keep going off our own way and forget you, right? And I should point out that I'm not saying that because I'm upset about any forks. Uh, this is just what's going on right now. And I think it's interesting because I proposed this talk a few months ago and it seems like things are like accelerating. <laughs> this keeps happening. Companies are trying to figure out, well, we have this open source, but now we're finding ourselves in an uncomfortable situation when it comes to our business and the open source and other businesses competing with us. So again, uh, post talk acceptance. Steve Klabnik wrote a couple articles, the second of which is called What Comes After Open Source. And just to be confusing, this quote is in the second article, but is a quote from the first article, just to be confusing. Uh, he says, today's developers have never learned about this history or don't care about it, meaning the history of open source and free software, or actively think it's irrelevant. For the same reasons that open source came up with a new name, versus free software, I think the movement that will arise from today's developers will also need a new name. And honestly, this is right in line with what I had been thinking, so thank you, Steve, for validating my thoughts. The idea that something's happening right now, a shift is happening, and the developers today are going to be defining what the future of open source or what comes after it will be. Is it time for a new license? I don't know, maybe it's just time for a new concept? I don't know, maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe we're just like in a weird fluctuating thing and you know, all these companies that are trying to do weird licenses are just gonna go away and we'll go back to how things were. I have no idea. But let's look back just for a moment. Free Software Foundation started in 1985. Open Source Initiative founded in 1998, again by Stallman and uh, Eric S. Raymond. Quick quiz, when was the term web app coined? 
I didn't expect you to know, I looked on Wikipedia. Wikipedia says 1999. In the Java documentation, they started using this word web app to define like this Java thing that you would build. What about SaaS, software as a service? According to Wikipedia, two years later, 2001. As you can tell, those are after Free Software Foundation and Open Source Initiative. And I would argue that the world we're living in today is much different than the world of 1985 and the world of 1998 from the perspective, of course, of building and selling software and services. Why does this matter? Well, because GPL and related licenses are based on the idea that if you build a derivative work of something under a GPL and then you distribute it, you must also distribute your changes. GPL v3 clarified that distribution means conveyed. I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but it didn't help me at all that they clarified it as conveyed. There's also AGPL, which has the most confusing name because it's actually G-A-G-P-L, uh, anyways. That tries to clarify, well, if you access the, the software over a network, then that counts as distribution. The problem with both of those is that they kind of rely on this concept of derivative work, and derivative work usually means, it seems like we usually interpret that as modified the software. If you don't do that, you have no obligations whatsoever. Okay. This is from the GPL FAQ. GPL FAQ. Uh, they say if you use GPL, it's awesome because this means you can avoid the risk of having to compete with a proprietary modified version of your own work. That sounds like what we're looking for, right? Well, let me tell you a story about a project called WP Scan. This is a WordPress scanner. It's an excellent tool. If you're running WordPress, you should use WP Scan definitely. WP Scan was licensed under GPL, I think version two, but I could be wrong. Definitely GPL. And the creator, maintainer of WP Scan and his team, they interpreted GPL maybe a little bit differently. And they started kind of going after these businesses that were building tools around WP Scan. And it caused a bit of controversy. And I don't know the truth of what happened or how aggressive this person or that person was. But they would go to these companies and say, look, you are building derivative works of our project. You need to buy a license from us. And companies didn't like that. In particular, this one uh, called Delve Labs, they posted this blog post, robbed at gunpoint. I don't know if they're embarrassed by that because it's gone now. Uh, but they basically ended up forking WP Scan and saying, here's an open source version. They tried to extort money from us. Uh, and we disagreed about what the GPL meant, and so we ended up forking it. There's some other licenses I, I kind of want to mention. So Nmap is a very popular network port scanning tool. They did something I found very interesting. It's licensed under GPL, but they clarified what they considered to be derivative works. One of the things they considered to be a derivative work is if you just run Nmap, take its output, modify it, and then present it to a user or a customer. That's very different than how I, I feel like most people interpret derivative work, but it actually seems to have been successful for them. They sell commercial licenses for the software, and as far as I know, it hasn't really caused any problems. I could be wrong. I didn't look that much into it, but I thought it was very interesting that they used GPL. They didn't modify the license. They just said, this is our interpretation of what a derivative work is. There's a couple more here. Uh, one, though, that I feel like I have to address is the Breakman public use license. As a part of the acquisition by Synopsys, the license under which Breakman is distributed changed for similar reasons to these other uh, licenses and projects. And I want the people here and the people watching to know that for most of you, if you're just using it for your own purposes, you're fine to continue doing so. And if you want to talk to me about this license, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, but I didn't want anyone to feel like I was hiding from the fact that Breakman itself also changed the license uh, post-acquisition. I have another thought for you. 
why is Creative Commons non-commercial so unacceptable to us as a community for software? And I don't mean because Creative Commons says don't use Creative Commons licenses for software. That's a different issue. What I mean is, why is it so hard for us to accept the idea of a non-commercial, open, free license when it seems like, and this is just my perception, it seems like we're totally cool with the idea of Creative Commons and the different options they have for different kinds of licenses, including non-commercial, meaning I take a picture, I make some art, I write something, I put it under Creative Commons non-commercial license, you can use it as long as you're not using it for a commercial use. People seem totally fine with that, but as soon as you try to apply it to software, it becomes a whole thing. Why? I don't know. I think that's something we need to think about. And I'm asking you to think about it because I don't know. I don't know why this is such a problem. So I'm gonna wrap up. I know I didn't present any solutions here, and if you were expecting me to drop, like, here's the like, new license that I wrote with a lawyer, uh, not happening. Uh, a lot of people have tried that and no one has been successful yet. You can look into um, some different things that have happened around that. But I just want to direct your attention to how we're thinking about open source and why we think about open source that way. Why is it that the community always has such violent reactions? And I didn't put it in this talk, but if you, look, if you saw recently, Chef switched to open sourcing more or all of their software. And you would have thought that the community was like, oh, cool, right? No, that's not how the community reacted. They weren't happy about it. And I don't, there's something going on there and I think we really need to examine it. And unfortunately, this is the end of my talk. So I don't have any grand conclusions for you. Just hopefully I've provoked some thoughts now, if you have some thoughts, there's a birds of a feather uh, session happening right after this in zone B. I assume this is in the lunch area as in previous years. Oh, wow. Someone's, some, thank you for nodding. Um, if you're unaware, birds of a feather is something I didn't know. First of all, uh, when I started going to conferences, no one actually said it. They're just like, boff. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that is. And they're like, birds of a feather. I'm like, I don't know what that is. If you don't know what that is, it just means it's an informal setup. Some people have signed up for some time slots. Um, it's like not a talk, it's just a little gathering of people. So if you're interested in this and you wanna talk more, you can come to this. Uh, of course, you can ask me questions afterwards. Thank you very much for attending. You can find me on the internet, President Beef. I will post these slides. All the slides and talks I've ever done are on my website. Uh, so these will also make them to the website and on Twitter. And of course, if you're interested in Breakman, you can go to breakman.org or on Twitter. And if you have any questions, of certainly uh, I'm happy to talk and answer and we can ch chat and see what your ideas are about this. Thank you.